What is a culture? Let's start with that, with that question. But obviously, one of the most difficult words in the English language, as, as we know. But the first kind of meaning of it is this fermentation, biological fermentation. And I actually kind of like this idea of culture, because it suggests that what you do is take a whole load of bland and inert milk around you, throw in something really exciting and bubbly, and transform a place. So it's a useful kind of metaphor for uh, what, we, what we're talking about. Second idea of culture is what groups do together to bond themselves into a community. So you can have an office culture, like these guys who put pumpkins on their head, and that turns them into a team somehow or other. And all around the world you can look at kind of weird and wonderful practices, and part of them is the idea that it creates a community. Then you have culture as something distinctive to a group in another way, which is kind of historical, through costume, through music, through dance, through all these kinds of things, which gets us into the realm of uh, the arts, another idea of culture, um, which, you, which, which used to be thought of as a sort of um, the higher end of what we meant by culture. I'll come back to that a little bit, bit later, but all those traditional art forms. Um, now here is Brian Eno of Roxy Music. And he and I had a very long discussion about what the ecology of culture means because he used the words when he did his John Peel lecture on the radio some, some time ago. Um, and his idea of what culture means is that it's any kind of creative act, anything that anybody wants to do that involves them creating something new or expressing themselves. So he includes things like doing your nails, cooking, any kind of everyday creative activity, which kind of pushing them the boundaries of what we mean by, by culture. So let's pause and think about what uh, an ecology is. Oh no, 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 one more thing I wanted to say about culture is this idea of is culture ordinary? Well I hope it is in the sense that it's accessible, it's around us all the time, it's easy to uh, engage with and so on. But I think it's also very extraordinary in that it provides us with some of the most exciting things in our lives. It can stop us in our tracks. Uh, and of course, if we are feeling creative, it can enable us to make a cry of existential rage in the face of a meaningless universe and all that. <laughs> so it is actually quite important as well as being uh, ordinary at the same time. So, that's culture. Ecology. Ecology, as you all know, comes from biology, and it's essentially the study of the relationships between things. Relationships, one of the most important words uh, I'm going to use this morning. Put the two together, and you can come up with a definition of what an ecology of culture is. This one is from an academic in California called Anne Markson, and she says that an arts and cultural ecology encompasses the many networks of arts and cultural creators, producers, presenters, sponsors, participants, podcasts, in diverse communities. We define the arts and cultural ecology as the complex interdependencies that shapes the demand for and production of arts and cultural offerings. So it's a bit wordy and academic, but essentially it's concentrating on the concepts of interconnection, interdependence, and networking rather than trying to look at parts and studying individual things or individual art forms and all that kind of thing. Now, there are two words missing from this definition, quite interestingly. Uh, two words that we would normally expect to find in most discussions of what culture is. So I won't put you through the torture of asking what they are. I'll suggest that they are artist and audience, neither of whom uh, is, is, is in here. So, a few things uh, flow from this definition of, of cultural ecology. One is, we're less interested in measuring parts, dividing the world up, and more interested in seeing how things fit together, cohere as a system, uh, and support each other, those interdependencies. So we're looking to try to break down all those barriers between art forms, different communities, the perceived division between the public and the private sector, and all those kinds of things. 
when looking at these kind of processes and interconnections, um, emphasizes as well the process that's going on, how one thing leads to uh, another. So we're not taking a snapshot, we're trying to think about culture as a very dynamic thing. And that in turn has some really interesting implications because honest examinations of process might conclude that we're better spending money in one place uh, than another to achieve, to achieve an end. Seeing a system as a whole as well can expose its weaknesses. If we start to think about how things connect together, we can see how, where those connections are actually broken, or where they need strengthening, or where they don't even exist. And you can easily trace connections, for example, between um, here in Kirklees, musicians in Opera North, living in the borough, then teach children, who then regenerate classical music through being able to play instruments. So things are uh, connected together in, in very interesting ways. Now, let's just think about some of the implications of what a systems approach and ecological approach are. One good advantage of adopting this kind of approach is that it's not an economic approach. Economic approaches to culture tend to um, make us think that the whole point of culture is economic, that it's there to um, make money, uh, that it's there to serve the economy in some kind of way. Um, but first and foremost, I expect all of you would agree, culture is fundamentally a matter of human development, not promotion of, of GDP. Art doesn't start out as a means to an economic end, even though it can make uh, a lot of money a long way. Second thing about ecology is that it is explicitly non-hierarchical. So we get rid of all those things of thinking that amateur work is no good, and, um, and the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden is fantastic. It is fantastic, but it takes away that hierarchy because it's easily into relationships interweaving with each other of how one creates the other. In a, nat in a natural ecology, it's obvious to see that a flea and an elephant are completely interdependent and that the foliage around them uh, needs both of them in order to exist and they need the foliage. In the same way, if we look at culture, we can see how everything fits together and everything is necessary. And a child's piano lesson becomes as important as Tate Modern, because all these things are flat in that sense. They are non-hierarchical. The third thing about the ecology of culture, I think, is that the phrase implies that this is a communal, a communal endeavour with disparate elements coming together to make something, to produce a whole where an experience is created by the audience as much as by the artist, by the coming together. So it's a social, a social phenomenon, where culture comes into being and is distributed and enjoyed through interaction and, and community. And one of the implications of that, of course, is that culture then promotes social capital and a good sense of place and living together. And finally, the, the the idea of an ecology of culture helps us to see our place in that ecology. Um, it, the, in a natural ecology, we are increasingly becoming to understand that we are embedded in it. The, the environment isn't something out there. We are creating the environment, and the environment is creating us. If you think about global warming, global warming affects the way that we act the way that we act affects global warming. Well, just in exactly the same manner, the same is true of culture. We in this room create culture. We in this room are created by culture. It's a really dynamic thing. We are molded by what we watch, listen to, read, all those, all those kinds of things. Um, last, before I move on to this slide, um, ecology deploys a lot of really useful concepts, that, I mean, when I talk about ecology, I'm talking about, you know, the environmental movement and things. 
that are transferable into the field of culture. Things like cooperation, collaboration, being held in balance, feedback loops in the system, self-regulating systems, mutual dependence, dynamism, process, all this all its kind of things. The one thing missing from a cultural ecology that I naturally is a moral purpose. Natural ecologies don't have a moral purpose, they just exist. Culture does not just exist. Culture is a set of political decisions and communal decisions of how we all spend our money. It comes into being through choices. And I think it's the responsibility of people working in the arts and funders and so forth to inject a kind of moral purpose into the ecology that we're, we're talking about. Okay, so that's an idea of culture, it's an idea of ecology, it's an idea of putting the two together. What, what does it look like in practice? Well, I, I tried to develop uh, four models of how you might think about this ecology working in practice. And the first one really kind of sticks to the idea of um, culture as an economy, where the money comes from. And I came up with this idea that there are, there are three spheres of culture inter interacting to create a hub. You've got funded culture, commercial culture, and homemade culture. Now, I could spend all day just talking about this slide, but I obviously can't. But let me, let me just run through very, very briefly. Um, funded culture, obviously, is what people decide to fund, so it's a kind of self-fulfilling uh, category. Commercial culture is where people are aiming to make a financial return out of it, even though they might have very high creative standards as well, and primary motivation is financial. The third one is homemade culture, where people are producing culture just for themselves in some kind of way or, or another, and that extends from um, amateur dance groups and drama groups um, through to uh, parties, all, all kinds of things, of people putting stuff on the internet, um, getting their own things out there without any sense of financial reward or needing anybody else to pay for, for any, anything. Now, the really interesting thing about all this is that in this part, the technological changes that have been going on over the last 20 years or so, even in the last 10 years, even in the last two years, are phenomenal, and they've actually changed the way all three of these sectors um, work. They've changed everything. And technology has destroyed and created business models in the commercial sector, for example. It's pretty obvious when you walk down the high street, there are far fewer record shops than there were, and everybody streams everything uh, these days. In funded culture, Technology has changed the way that arts organisations can interact with their, their public and how they can inform them of things and how they can educate and help people to learn. And incredible tools available in that, in that part of the world. But the most important thing, I think, about technology is how it's led to a complete explosion of creativity, particularly here at the homemade bit. I don't know anyone under the age of 25 who isn't in a band or a dancer, or a poet, or posting things on Instagram. The whole of, of uh, and that kind of youth culture, it seems to me, is just exploding the creativity because they've got the, the, tools, the tools to do it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really made things amazingly, amazingly different. Just a couple of, let's take a couple of real examples. One, an amateur choir. So, an amateur choir will link all of these three sectors together quite efficiently. They will probably employ and pay for, off their own bat, um, a professional to lead them, to teach them, and they might well employ professional singers when they do a performance. They will use the publicly funded parts to find a concert hall where they can perform. They will use the commercial bit, maybe to put out a CD, if they can. And they will use the homemade bit to post what they've done on YouTube, so that more people uh, can see it. 
So you've got a melding, a convergence of these three things, which used to occupy, like I say, as recently as about 20 years ago, these used to occupy really different and often antagonistic and certainly hierarchical parts of the cultural world. And now they're converging and working together. Another example might be um, a rock band trying to make their way in the world. They used to have to rely on um, a commercial studio with unionized labor and an extremely long production change from going in the studio to delivering the record to, uh, to a shop. And now all that's changed because you can do it in your bedroom. What's important now is not is, is you get the the uh, record deal with the record company by somehow attracting a fan base through YouTube or busking or whatever, and you take that to the record company rather than having to persuade some kind of gatekeeper A and R guy um, to come to your to your gig in the pub. It's completely changed the way that a, the a rock band now will approach the way that they want to get their work in, in front of people. So very, very interesting what's, what's been going on. Second thing is like culture as process. And I'm going to go through this very rapidly. But culture, culture follows a creative process. And if you think of maybe punk rock, for an example, it's, kind of, it's an act of creation, but it doesn't come out of anywhere. So at the creation point, when you've got Matt and McLaren and Vivian Westwood and the Sex Pistols and everything, what are they doing? They're reviving things like um, s &M culture, uh, cowboy culture, uh, denim, uh, all, all kinds of things that they're bringing into the mix to create something absolutely and extraordinary and new. What happens then is it goes through like a curation phase where a few people decide that this is interesting, pick up on it and start to take notice. Then goes into a, a collection phase where it goes broader into mainstream uh, culture and everybody starts appreciating it. And then museums get hold of it and think, ah, oh, this is culturally significant. So the VNA starts buying uh, ripped PPC jeans. And then a fashion designer goes into the archive of the VNA and thinks, oh, that's a good idea. I'll turn that into a dress and Elizabeth Hurley will wear it to a film premiere. So, if you, if you think about that as a process, it then gets picked up again and somebody else does something with it. And it all goes in a lovely big circle all, all the time. So it's quite important to think about whether all these things exist, how they are facilitated, whether they're easy, whether they're difficult. And just a couple of things to pick up on, on here. First is that that create part often comes from the creative margins. It comes from the edges of society. It comes from rough clubs and art schools and poor parts of town uh, that are important. Um, second thing about it is that any kind of creative output is also an input, and any input is also uh, an output. And the third thing is that experimentation, risk-taking, which the funded sector often provides, um, are absolutely vital to this continuing uh, process of re recycling. So this, this looks like, not by accident, kind of a kind of life cycle. And it is a kind of, kind of a life cycle of culture. Third way of thinking about the ecology is, uh, is this one. Culture as a network. So we can take a culture, and as I said earlier on, that it's all about interdependencies, interconnections, mutual working, and so forth. And these are just a couple of network diagrams. They don't really mean anything uh, today, except to note one has a lot denser connections than the other. And it, this is actually a real map of the Royal Shakespeare Company at two different points in time. The first one, uh, how they were. The second, how they were after making a great effort to make people communicate more, understand each other's jobs better, get together in more meetings, uh, spend more social time together. 
So in other words, what they've done is by, by, this, by lots of small acts, they have in, intensified their network and created a denser set of connections which then bore fruit in both artistic and financial success. So the network, the, the improvement of the network, was vitally important to the improvement of the art, to the improvement of the money, and to the improvement of the audience and experience. So I think that's quite a really in interesting slide. So is this one. Many thanks to uh, Jeremy Della for, for letting me use this one. I think the original's in tape somewhere. But I absolutely adore this. It's a, a, a piece that he wrote to show the connections between brass bands and acid house music. And what I like about it, especially, is that when, we, when you look at most network maps, they're like people or organisations and how they link together and the line, line between them. What Jeremy Dell has done here is stick in not just people, but places and phenomena and ideas. So you've got summer of love, uh, an idea and a thing. Uh, the mind strike, an event, Castle Morton, a place, the open air, privatisation, all these kind of ideas coming together to explain this creative and cultural phenomenon of acid house and how it links to a prior tradition. And I think doing, doing one of these, you know, go home and fiddle about with this, it's absolutely fascinating to try to replicate things. And it really deepens your understanding about how things come into being, how they, how they come, come about. So, network's very, very important. Um, and it's worth interrogating them to see where the connections lie, where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are. Because um, those connections, those network connections, they're not just like a one-way stream of traffic. It's not like if you've got a, a, a marketing strategy or something, that you have a network connection with your audience. That, that connection is an interface. It's a two-way communication, not a one-way shout. So you, it's really worth, I would encourage everybody to kind of read more about network theory, what networks mean, why they're so important. Because networks are really the way that we get everything done these days. Even if you work in an organisation, you're essentially operating a network through the people that you know outside the organisation uh, to, make, to make things happen. We're all embedded in these networks. So you can map your own, you sit down with a piece of paper and see who, who's important. And then you start thinking about, well, if I want to get to them, how do, I, how do I do that? How do I use my network? But one important thing to remember about networks is that once you put something out into a network, it's out there. And you can never get it back. So, um, yeah, network's very, very, very important. We've got four minutes before we have a break, so uh, I will romp through this one. Um, this is an idea of culture as structure, or culture as roles. Because I looked at culture and I thought, well, every single culture has got to have these four things in it in order to operate. And this gets us away from the idea of culture as an economy, because both the public and private sector, both commercial and funded, exist in, in all, all parts of this diagram. So guardians are the people who look after our culture. So paradigmatically, that would be a public library or a museum or something like that. But it's also Disney and Sony who own the copyright to the songs that are going around our heads uh, all day. And it's also the memory and the craft of people who are involved in a cultural tradition who pass it on to the next generation without any form of record other than that in their own head. These people are guardians of our, of our culture and we need them because as the process diagram showed, we need that in order to draw on to, to, have, our, to have our own creativity. Down at the bottom not right, you've got platforms. Again, platforms, public and private sector. So we have theatres, but we also have pubs and clubs, 
And we also now have the internet and digital platforms that we can put stuff on. We need platforms in the culture because it's the interface, it's where the artist gets in front of the public. It's where the public goes to engage with the artist. So we've got to have platforms. The next one is connectors up there on the right. This is an absolutely vital and undervalued part of any cultural ecology. It's those people who have, those organisations, those people who have the energy and resources to put people together. Producers, impresarios, people who say, oh, you need to meet. All of those people. It's very, often a really quite informal role, but an absolutely vital one. And it's worth trying to identify in your own local cultural ecology who those people are and to support them as much as possible. And finally, we've got uh, nomads, which I, I called it nomads because I, I just thought of this idea of all the audiences, all of us, whether we're in a row as an artist or an audience member or walking down the street, we're kind of wandering around, grazing upon this marvellous field of culture, which is all around us and everywhere and cheese chips these days. It's absolutely a wonderful time to be alive uh, if we're talking about culture. Nothing could be better. Um, I think I just finished on the note that we're incredibly lucky to be alive in such rich cultural times and that everything is abundant. But actually the only thing that isn't abundant and that is very strictly limited is time. So I will get on with it and finish up. <laughs> So these models, we can draw from some ideas and some ways of approaching the world that, that help us, I think, to generate some practical tools to, to improve culture. So they prompt some questions. For example, let's look at our local ecology and think about do all these exist? And do they all exist in the right kind of ways? Are we supporting those connected with us? Do we have a rich heritage in something which isn't properly recorded, where there's no guardianship, and that guardianship needs to be here for the community that we, we live in? Um, we can think about those platforms. Who has access to those platforms? Are they being used in the most efficient manner that they, they could be? It saddens me how so many of our platforms are dark for most of their lives. Uh, and, and how much more we could be getting out of a lot of the infrastructure that we've, that we've got. So have a look at that. Another thing to do is take that slide about the, this one and think about that. How does, how does this creative cycle work in the, in the local context? What are the inputs it needs from outside? What does it export? Look at this one and start asking yourself, who's working with who? Who's sharing their resources with somebody else? Where's the talent? Who is sharing? Who cooperates? How much mutual support is there in there? Or have we in fact set up a system that competes for resources rather than tries to be mutually supportive? It's worth interrogating all these, all these questions. How strong is the network? And if it's not strong enough, why is it not strong enough? And what can we do? What can we do about it? Because things can be done. Very easy things can, can be done. One important thing about a map like this is that it just shows things rather statically on, uh, as lines and nodes. But of course, these are all dynamic relationships. And one thing you need to think about if you're doing a network map like this is the quality of those relationships. It's all very well saying, oh yeah, I know X. But what, what's, the, what's the conversation like? How good is it? How easy is it? Um, how porous is this system? Is it welcoming to outside influence? Is it repulsive to them? How do people get into the system? How easy it is, is it to en engage with this? You might ask the question, what are the vital signs in our ecology? Where's the life? Where's the energy? Who's feeding on who? All kinds of interesting questions emerge when you start to think of it as a, as a kind of organism. Um, and the, another, and one final point is, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the exosystem? 
Uh, the mayor mentioned in her words the idea of transport and how important that is. And of course, this cultural ecosystem I've been talking about exists within a broader world. We could have brought into the thing, into this discussion, food, religion, transport, education, a whole load of exosystem considerations that we need to think about uh, uh, as, as well. Um, and we can think about where the vulnerabilities are in the system. Some of those might lie with transport or education or law. So I hope I've persuaded you in this presentation, A, that this is an interesting set of ideas that we can play with and it, it stimulates our imagination to think about what our, our local culture, how we're embedded in it. But more importantly, to think about how we can improve things, how we can get together more, how we can share things more, how we can make it all, all work. Um, one final slide is, is this, which is, uh, of course, kind of a paradigmatic example of an ecosystem, the Amazon rainforest that we all know, vulnerable it is, how rich it is in species and life. Um, and we're used to thinking of the rainforest as something that is produced by the rain. Not surprisingly, the rain falls, the shoots thrive, and we end up with this amazing canopy and rich in all these species and so forth. But a deeper ecological understanding is that the rainforest exhales and creates the rain which falls to nurture it. So it's a system that isn't a rainforest because of the rain. It's a system that is also the rain because of the rainforest. So you're in the position of being the rainforest and it's up to you to make it rain to nurture yourselves. And surely in West Yorkshire, it's got to be easier to make it. <laughs> and I'm going to leave it there. Thanks. <laughs>